and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise but who can stop the lord almighty our god is a lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is a lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chain
Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus
again, set me on fire, set me on fire. just open up our arms and dump it all at your feet. Because when we open our arms out to you, Lord, we can't hold anything. Thank you that you are here for us right now. Thank you that you are here in this moment, ministering to our hearts and to our, our minds and healing our bodies and just being with us and holding us close. Thank you for today and thank you for being here. And I just ask you to go before us as we are about to hear your word, Lord, that you will just speak through pastor, bless him, and give him your words for us, that we can be changed, miraculously changed today, Lord, and walk out of here different people. In your name I pray, amen.
Good morning, good morning. All right, all right, all right. Man, oh man, come on, man. Good morning. Man, oh goodness gracious, man. Is this the land of the dead or the land of the living today? We need to be alive in Jesus, right? <laughs> all right, joke or no joke this morning? You sure? All right, last week you guys kind of booed me a little bit, man. So, you know, I'm a little nervous about coming out with a joke this morning. So, all right, so this pastor, man, he hears about this, this uh, block that's having a garage sale or like, you know, garage sales, right? So he's going out and he's looking at different things and he finds this lawnmower and he goes, oh, man, I need a lawnmower bad. So he asks the dude how much for the mower. The dude says, hey, man, I'll give it to you for 20 bucks. 20 bucks, what a deal, man. He gets it home, man, getting ready to mow his lawns. He starts pulling the cord, pulling the cord, pulling the cord. Pull. Can't get the thing to start. He gets upset, man, Lord, what is this, man? The guy ripped me off, so he goes, I'm going to go take it back. So he goes back over to the dude, and he goes, listen here, man. He goes, I gave you 20 bucks. I gave you what you asked for. You told me the lawnmower worked. It's not working. He says, man, every time I pull the, the cord, it doesn't work. He goes, hey, man, he goes, there's a secret to it. You got to cuss. And he's like, cuss? He goes, man, I'm a pastor, man. I don't even remember how to cuss. He says, pull on that cord a few more times, and you will. You guys are a tough audience, man. <laughs> Boy, you're a tough audience. There's a theology that is out there in the church today that says that the church has replaced Israel. The nation of Israel is no longer valid. The Jews are no longer valid. And that the church has replaced the nation of Israel. But this appears to be contrary to what the Bible says and especially what Paul says to the Romans in chapters 9 through 11. And so this message has been on my heart for, for quite a few months. Um, I actually, it's one of my course studies that I went through. Uh, and, and I've titled this message, Will All Israel Be Saved? Because that's the question. Is Israel relevant? Is the nation of Israel actually going to be saved? according to scripture or has the church replaced the nation of israel and is that what's being talked about so church we are going to be in class for a few weeks okay we're going to be in class we'll be breaking down the word of god we're going to go verse by verse through romans 9 through 11 and hopefully through this we're going to learn some things about what we have been taught things that are correct that may be incorrect we're going to be challenged in our relationship with jesus and and most importantly i want us to understand that god's word is important every single word in the bible has significance and so we need to take the time to be students of the bible and so that's what we're going to do today now before we get started in romans chapter 9 through 11 i think it's important to understand who is the apostle paul there's a lot of things that have been written about Paul through the, through the centuries. There's things that are correct. There's things that are incorrect. So we're going to tackle those things, those thinkings. And once we understand who Paul is, I think it's going to bring into light the importance of what he's saying to the Romans in chapters 9 through 11. So I have a question for you this morning. Have you ever wondered what the writers of the bible what was going on through their minds as they're pinning what they're pinning i want you to think about something see god uses us as his instruments today the worship team along with our multi-tracks were used as instruments to bring us into a time of worship where we could praise and worship our father in heaven god desires to work in us and through us and so the writers of the bible we're being inspired by the Holy Spirit. We either believe in the Bible or we don't. There is no half-truths in the Bible, three-quarter truths. Either you believe the Word of God or you don't. If there's one thing in the Bible that you don't believe, then you don't believe in the Word of God. Right? There's things that are difficult for us to understand. Things that are difficult for us to grasp. That doesn't make them any less of a truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here Paul clearly writes that all scripture is God breathed. So the writers of the Bible were being breathed into by God to pen what was on God's heart and his message to the people of Israel and to the church. Yet in doing so, and here's what I want you to grasp, God used the writer's personality and his background in the writing of the Bible. God doesn't just take you and then suddenly transform you and make you a, a God robot. God takes who you are and uses it to his glory. That's why we're individuals. So as we begin the study of Romans, it's important to understand who Paul is and why God used Paul specifically to the Gentiles. So let's pray. Father, we pray as we go into this time of your word that you would help us to have clarity and understanding, God. Father, that we'd have open hearts and open minds. As I was personally challenged on some of the things that I had been taught in the past, Lord, uh, I pray that um, you would enlighten us today. Uh, Father, we're just here to seek the truth, God, and what that truth is. And, and Lord, we may disagree or agree, but we do want to agree on one thing, that Jesus is Lord, and that, Father, that you sent him for redemption, to save us from destruction, and we thank you for that. So, Holy Spirit, teach us today, and we ask this in Jesus' name, and all the saints said. Amen. I want to start by saying that most of the background that I'm going to share with you today comes from primarily from one of my professors, Dr. Nicholas Shazer. And then also I have references that I'm using from the historian Josephus, who was, uh, he was very, very influential in what we understand and know historically about the first century as far as the church is concerned. And then some, some other, of course, commentators and, and uh, resources. And so the first thing that I want to point out to you this morning about Paul, and this is something that we need to grasp, is that Paul was a devout Jewish Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish Pharisee. But here's the thing. He had a radical encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. On the road to Damascus, Jesus and him have this radical encounter. And Paul's life forever was changed. And before this encounter, you need to understand that Paul was literally at war with his fellow Jews who were now following Jesus. See, here's what we fail to understand as the church, is that Christianity, as we know today, that wasn't what was going on in Paul's time. The gospel message came to the Jews first. All the disciples were Jewish. All the writers of the, body are, of the Bible are Jewish. I know that some uh, seminaries and, and colleges teach that Luke was a Gentile. I came from a college and seminary that taught that. I have learned now that he is not, he was not a Gentile. He was using a Gentile name, but he was still a Jew. He was still Jewish in, in, in his ethnicity. That's why Paul or Luke knew so many things about the customs of the Jews. It wasn't because he was hanging out with Paul. It's because he was one. And so Paul is literally at war with his fellow Jews. And then he has this encounter. And once he has this encounter, he becomes an outspoken proponent of Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah. He realizes that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the long-awaited Messiah that all of his fathers have talked about for thousands of years. Jesus is the one, and he meets him on the road to Damascus. Powerful moment, man. I hope all of us have had a Damascus experience. Now, Paul says of himself in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, he says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Now, some people take that verse and say, well, see, Paul says his former life in Judaism. He's not talking about separating from Judaism. He says, when I was in Judaism prior to meeting Jesus, this is what I did. I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. He did. He says, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. He's like, man, dude, nobody, at, out, they, nobody excelled far, farther than I did. I was the dude. 
But when he who had set me apart before I was born, a predestination reference, we're going to talk about predestination in a couple weeks, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. It pleases God to reveal his son to us, church. Do you understand that? It pleases him. It's not like God is trying to shroud Jesus from us. No, he wants to expose Christ to us. In order that I might preach among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anybody. So here Paul describes who he was. He describes this encounter. And then he describes what he was to do. Which is to preach Christ among the Gentiles. It's important to remember this point. That Paul remained a Jew his entire life. And still identified as a Pharisee after meeting Jesus. He did not convert to Christianity. He came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Jewish Scripture. Romans chapter 11, verse 1 says this. I ask then, has God rejected his people? He's, he's asking the Romans, has God rejected Israel? He says, by no means. For I myself am an Israelite a descendant of Abraham, and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. So in this verse, Paul identifies himself as an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. He says, hey, I'm, we're all in this together. I'm one. And he says, I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul never separated himself from who he was. Christ is the fulfillment of, Jesus said, I came to what? Fulfill the law, not abolish the law. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says, look, if, if I can brag, anybody can brag, it's me. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, hey, I'm a Hebrew, baby. And as to the law, a Pharisee. Again, this is Paul writing to the Philippians saying, look, guys, you got to understand, this is who I am. Christ is the fulfillment of who I am. Paul uses the fact that he's a Pharisee in a very critical situation. He's having a confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Acts chapter 23. And as he's having this conversation with them about the Messiah, about who Jesus is, the Christ, and he's sharing the gospel, he, he plugs in to the Pharisees. Now, you have to remember, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. They said, there is no resurrection. Once you die, you die. It's all good. But Paul was a Pharisee. And so in Acts chapter 23, verse 6, he says this. Now, when Paul received that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee a son of the Pharisees, it was with respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. So Paul here. Now, this is not prior to Paul's uh, encounter with Jesus. This is not two years. This is, we're talking many, many, many years past his encounter with Jesus. He still says, I'm a Pharisee and a son of a Pharisee. It never changed. So this is why Paul would always honor the feasts. Do you remember in the book of Acts? He would travel back to Jerusalem for what? The Passover, for the Feast of the Tabernacles, for this, for Pentecost, all these things. Why? Because Paul never left his roots. His roots were in Judaism as a Jew. But now with Christ his, his life has been fulfilled. Now he understands who the Messiah is. And now he gets all the things that have been, had been taught to him in the Torah. They finally make sense. Ah, now I get it. It's Jesus. But wait a minute, Pastor. When Paul encounters Christ, right? He's called Saul. But later in Acts and in his writings... He's referred to as Paul. Well, here's what you need to understand. Paul neither converts to Christianity, but rather he comes into a relationship with Jesus. And one other misconception is 
He never changes his name. See, people say that Paul changed his name, right? But does he change his name? Does he? Now, many Bible teachers and theologians, one of them was me. I used to teach that Paul changed his name after or Saul changed his name to Paul after his Damascus Road experience. That there was this conversion that happened. And so when this conversion happened, man, Paul could no longer be Saul. He had to, he, he, he had to be named Paul. And so, and, and here's the thinking behind this. Many times in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we see that there's name changes. Right? Is that not true? Jacob, who did he become? Abram. Sarai. Good. Even Peter got a nickname, right? Even Peter got, got, got a nickname, The Rock, you know. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, baby, you know, so. <laughs> so listen, this is understandable how this can be misinterpreted as a name change after his encounter with the Messiah, with Jesus. But here's the problem with that thinking. Fifteen times in Acts, after his encounter with Jesus, he is called Saul. Saul, 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 Saul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, Saul, 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 right? It's not until Acts chapter 13 that we see the name Paul used. Why? Why was the change? Well, again, this is why we look at Scripture. This is why we have to tear Scripture apart. This is why we need to understand the original writing, the, how things were written in the Greek and in the original language or in the Hebrew language or in the Aramaic language. Some of the Bible's in Aramaic. If you go to Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 6, it says this. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. That's Acts chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, right? Or 6 and 7. But then in Acts chapter 13, verse 9, we see something interesting. But Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at them. So in verse 7, Sergius Paulus was a proconsul who summoned Mar Barnabas and Saul to hear the word of God. In verse 9, we see that Saul suddenly gets referred to as Paul by Luke. Why the change? Two things are going on. First, Saul never changed his name to Paul. He never did that. It was not uncommon for minority groups of people who became Roman citizens or who were born in the Roman Empire to also have a Roman name. It was like saying, this name makes me part of the Roman Empire and makes, it makes me a Roman. Okay? That's basically what it is. Saul was the Hebrew name that was given to him by his father. But the Romans also gave him a name, and it was Paul. That was his citizenship. And here's what you need to understand. Luke here is pointing out that Saul's Roman name, Paul, is the same as Sergius Paulus. That name in the Greek, Paulus, is Paul in the English language. And he's saying it, therefore, he was making Paul like more identifiable with his, his Roman counterpart there, the Sergius Paulus that had is summoned him and Barnabas to speak. Well, now he's got some account. He's got, hey, I'm, I'm Paul too, dude. Hey, same name, right? Well, that's a great tidbit, Pastor. Thanks a lot for sharing that. But why does Luke and the rest of Acts and Saul in his letters identify himself as Paul? If that's the case, I mean, okay, so that was a situation where, hey, I'm relatable, right? Got you. Because here's what you need to know. Acts chapter 13 is the beginning of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. Prior to that, Paul had been interacting with Barnabas, with, with the Jews, with those who were practicing Judaism. And so here in chapter 13, now Paul's ministry begins. And so from this point forward, because his ministry is to the Gentiles, Luke starts to refer to him as Paul. Why? Because it makes him more identifiable with, identifiable with his Gentile counterparts. Paul's letters were to Gentile believers. And of course, there were Jews that were in the mix. 
But here's the thing. By going by Paul, it gave him credibility. It was almost kind of like a PR move, right? Oh, we're going to do a little public relations stuff here. So that's why Paul was referred to as Paul instead of Saul. There's always a reason in it. And it's not always what we're taught. I have taught for 25 years that Paul's name was changed from Saul because of his Damascus Road encounter. Totally inaccurate. I had to go back and I had to read scripture. I had to understand what was being pinned there. I had to understand who Luke was. I had to understand why Luke was writing what he wrote. See, studying the word of God is much more than just reading it and coming up with your own ideas. That's what gets the church in trouble. We teach a lot of things that aren't necessarily facts. We're 2,000 years removed from the very first writers of the Bible. It's very easy for us to maybe get a little distorted or a little bit off in some things that we think. Now, for Paul, you need to understand this. When <clears throat> Paul was sent to the Gentiles, correct? But Paul saw two groups of people in the world. There was Jews... And there was everybody else. Were they everybody else? Okay. He understood what Scripture said about the two groups of people. Because of this, he also understood the unity that God wanted between the two groups of people through Messiah Jesus. So it's important that we understand that when Paul is referencing things, and if you really read Scripture, like in Galatians, he says there's, there's no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor, nor free, nor whatever, poor, nor rich, whatever, right? He's referencing to our position in Christ. That's what he's referencing to. But there is still a separation, and we're going to see what that separation is here in a few minutes. Now, Romans 3.29 says this, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Well, no, of course he's not. Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of course he is. So Paul's saying, look, God is the God of the Jews. He's the God of the Gentiles. I want you to understand that. That's the unity part in Jesus. He says in 1 Corinthians 1 23, he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. So both the Jews and the Gentiles were stumbled over the gospel message, right? What did Paul say later? He says, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So we see in these two scriptures that Paul distinguishes between the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, right? There's a distinction there. Now, here's something else you need to understand. Paul understood that he was an apostle that was sent to the Gentile world. He understood that. Although he was Jewish, Although his roots were in Judaism, he understood that God had a special call for him, and it was to the Gentile world. Romans eleven thirteen, 13, and we'll get to this in a few weeks. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. What is Paul saying there? He's saying, look, Paul states that although he is a Jewish believer in Christ, that he's been sent to minister the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and because of this, his ministry was magnified by going to the Gentiles. In other words, it was enhanced. Why? Here's what you need to understand. Those of you who went through the book of Acts with us, remember that every time Paul entered a city, where did he go to first? To where? To the synagogue. Who was in the synagogue? The Jews were. Why? Because they had the scripture. See, everything in the New Testament, there's not one thing written in the New Testament. I challenge you to find one thing that is not in the Old Testament. Not one thing. The Old Testament was what they used to verify who Jesus was. But somehow we separate the two books. They're not separate. They're one complete book. They're one He always went to the Jews first with his message. And when the Jews rejected him, not all of them did, but when the majority of them did, he would then go to the Gentiles. Why? Because he had a love for his Jewish brethren. And we will see this next week when we start in Romans chapter 9. So because of this, we need to understand, that we need to understand how the Jews, the Gentiles, and the works of the law 
how that all fits together. Because isn't that the battle that we always seem to see in Scripture? How Paul is always trying to say, you shouldn't be trying to do the works of the law, and you shouldn't be trying to do this, and Gentile believers, you need to do it, and Jewish believers. And so we need to understand how this fits together. So I want to just take a few moments to kind of talk about it, to help us have some clarity again on why Paul is going to write what he writes in Romans. Now, Paul makes it clear in Scripture Everywhere in Scripture, he makes it clear that Jews and Gentiles are loved equally by God. But he says that Gentiles are not to do the works of the law. What does that really mean? Well, first off, we need to understand this. That the Torah, the law, was given to the people of Israel. For what purpose? To set them apart, right? to set them apart from the other nations. They had just come out of one of the most ungodly nations you could ever imagine with the nation of, with the, 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 with Egypt. I mean, Egypt had a God for everything. There's the, there's the sand dog God and the pebble God. And I mean, it didn't matter what it was. I mean, you know, they worshiped everything. So they, the law was to set them apart. The works of the law Do not encompass every Torah command. This is what we need to understand. But only those that are specific to the nation of Israel. For instance, God tells the nation of Israel not to eat certain foods. That's a dietary law. He doesn't require that of us. They weren't to eat certain things, right? They were to dress a certain way. They had to dress a certain way, especially those who were uh, the, the priests who carried out the edicts of, of God before the altar, right? If you were a male, you had to be circumcised, right? There was no getting around it. Eighth day, we're chopping, right? They had purity stipulations in place, right? If a woman was, was, was on her period, she was unclean for seven days, And when she was done, she had to go ceremonially wash herself, dress herself. Every every piece of clothing she had had to be washed. Anything that her body touched had to be washed. There were these purity uh, stipulations that were in place. So this is what Paul is thinking of when he talks of the works of the law. That's what he's talking about. And Paul makes it clear in his writings that the works of the law are commands in the Torah that are only for the Jews to practice and do not involve in uh, or involve or address Gentiles. That's the bottom line. That's what Paul's talking about. If you go to Romans 3, chapters, uh, verses 28 through 30, he says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, Who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Paul is saying here that it is faith that justifies all. Whether a Jew practicing the works of the law or a Gentile, it's all about faith. Works of the law such as circumcision were fine for Gentiles, or excuse me, for Jews, but they were prohibited for Gentiles. And according to Paul, Meriting righteousness through the works of the law is not a Jewish notion. If you really look at what Paul writes in Galatians and Romans and Philippians and these other books, if you really understand the tense and the way that the verbiage is being used in these letters, you would get the impression that it's the Jews who are pushing their agenda. It was not. It was rather Gentiles desired to be under the law because they, they think it will Give them more favor with God. Galatians 4.21 Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? What is Paul saying there? Well, he's addressing Gentile believers in Galatia, and he's asking them, if you desire to be under the law, are you going to do all that it asks you to do? Are you going to do it? Are you going to not only because see the Gal- the Galatians wanted to get circumcised. They thought, man, if we get circumcised, that's, that makes us holier than now. That's the that's the covenant. Well, it is the covenant with Abraham. That covenant is still going to be fulfilled. The Abrahamic covenant covenant is still going to be fulfilled, but it's coming later. But they wanted to be 
They wanted to be circumcised. And Paul's like, dude, you don't have to be circumcised, man. That's not going to make you closer to God. It's a, it's a heart issue. And that was something that was set aside for the nation of Israel, not for the Gentiles, not for you. So why this separation between Jews and Gentiles if we're all one in God? Well, here's something I never knew. Now, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. I've studied the Bible, but I, I never, I never seen this. In Paul's mind, if Gentiles do the works of the law, if they get circumcised, if they do the dietary things, if they dress, have the Jewish dress code, it's, then Gentiles become Jews which counteracts God's end-time goal of Israel and the nations worshiping together. What? That's baloney. It's not. Zechariah 8.23. Never have I... I've read this verse, but I haven't read this verse, right? It's like, oh, this was foreign. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying... Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That is an end times prophecy. That hasn't happened yet. This is going to happen during the millennium. This is going to happen during the millennium. When, the, when Jesus is going to judge the nations, right? He's going to judge the nations, and then the nations that get through that judgment during the millennium are going to come and hang out with Jesus and they're going to be taught what it means to worship God. I told you guys that during the millennium, the temple sacrifices will still be happening. Why? They don't need to happen. They're going to be a reminder of what Jesus did for us. Right? That's all in the Bible. I mean, I, I'm just telling you what's in the word. Isaiah says something similar about the nations coming in together with the Jews and worshiping. Habakkuk says it. Amos says it. It's all throughout the Bible that the nations of the world are going to come together with the Jews in the end times. And Jew and Gentile are going to worship God together. For Paul, Gentile do, Gentiles doing the works of the law would make them into Israel. And make it so there would no longer be other families of the earth for Israel to bless. See, the Bible tells us that Israel is going to be a blessing to the nations. So we've seen that Paul does not want Gentiles performing works of the law that mark Jewish identity. But he encourages Gentiles to keep various other Torah commands. What? Yes, he does. Think about it. First, let's read Romans 7, 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So Paul says that the law is holy. The law is holy. It, was, it came from God to Moses. And contrary to what we have been taught in the Western church, me included, the law had love and mercy in it. But we've been taught through the years that the law is bad. That it's bad. It's a bunch of rules and regulations and, and all these other types of things. It was filled with love and mercy. God said, do this and I will bless you abundantly. That's, doesn't he do that with us as Christians? Do you think that you can keep on going? Do you think you can just keep sinning if you belong to Jesus that he's just going to let you keep sinning? He's not. He gonna, eventually he's going to get, it says that God chastises those whom he loves. That means he, he spank your bottom. Right? That means he's going to get the belt out. Yuck! <laughs> no, Paul says the commandments in the law are good. As long as a given command does not make a Gentile a Jew, then a Gentile is free to and should observe it. For example, the law states we should not murder. I don't think any of you are going to go out and kill today. The, it says we should not commit adultery. I pray that you don't have that in your heart. It says we should not steal. We should not covet. That's part of the law, church. Are we supposed to just, up? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not under the law now. I'm, I'm free to do what I want to do. No, you're not. That's a lie from the pit of hell, man. What did Jesus say? 
Oh, man. See, I'll get you with Jesus, man. Yeah, everything else. But when I pull Jesus in, that's it. (laughs) Jesus said that the law could be summed up in this way. What was it? Love God. Love your neighbor. He said, that's the law. See, the law is love. See, when I don't kill you, steal from you, try to steal your wife, try to do this, do that, I'm loving you. Church, love does not do wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And isn't that who Jesus is? Isn't Jesus love? Jesus is love, man. And we forget that. We forget that Jesus loves us so much, man. Listen, I'm not teaching anything contrary to what I believe. I'm, bringing, I'm putting some icing on what I believe. I'm having a deeper knowledge of what Scripture really means and what it meant for Paul to pin what he's going to pin to the Romans. So to sum up today, hey, I'm ahead of time. Paul was a devout Jew his entire life. Paul was a devout Jew his entire life, but he had Jesus. He had Jesus. And he was going to preach Jesus. He was not going to preach Judaism. He was going to preach Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah. That's who he was going to preach. And Paul explains really in Romans what any Bible reading Jew knew, that performing the commands in the Torah does not lead to righteousness. Instead, one is made righteous by what? Love, faith, right? That's what the the righteous shall be what? Justified by what? Faith. It's faith in God. And that faith in God is fulfilled through Christ Jesus. That's how it's fulfilled. It's through Jesus. He's the culmination of all of it. Ain't that right? Give me an amen, girl. Y'all can talk back. It's cool. Now, listen, you need to understand. Paul is writing this letter to the Romans. And if you remember a few months back, I talked about this. He's writing the letter to Roman Christians who are rejecting their Jewish brothers and sisters who are coming back from being in exile. Caesar, 15 years earlier, had exiled the, the Jews because he thought they were troublemakers. They were rebellious. They would not bow their knee to any of the Roman gods. They were only going to bow their knee to, 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 uh, to uh, Yahweh. That was it. So he said, get out of Rome. Y'all make me sick. But then a new Caesar came in and he said, you guys can come back. So they're starting to come back. And as they're coming back into the city, Roman Christians, Roman believers who had been on their own for 15 years are now being infiltrated by these Judaizers. Wait a minute, they want to celebrate the Passover. They want to do the Feast of the Tabernacles. What's going on here? This is garbage. This, is, this ain't right. We replaced you. That's where the replacement theology started. We replaced you. When you got kicked out, we became it. And that's not the truth. <laughs> we didn't replace anything. See, you need to understand for Paul, Gentiles are included in God's family, but were included as what? Adopted children. We see this in Romans 8, 15. You can look that up on your own. But they do not become biological children of Israel, nor are they spiritual Jews. There's people that teach the church are spiritual Jews today. It's not what's being taught. And while there is no theological hierarchy between Jews and Gentiles, As we see in Galatians 3.28, you guys can read that on your own. These groups need need to stay ethnically distant so that the vision and prophecy of the prophets can come to pass in the end of times. That's the reason. Again, we're all one in Christ. Let's don't ever get that that confused. But there there are Jewish believers I personally know that that celebrate the passover right all all my professors have just they they participated in the day of atonement in israel last week and this week with sukkot they participate why because that's their heritage who they are 
but it doesn't take away from their faith and trust and love for Jesus Christ as the Messiah because he says that ultimately he is. He is the Messiah. Paul was the perfect instrument to address the issues of the Gentile believers because of his background in Judaism. And that's why, church, it's important to understand who the writer of each book is. As I stated in the beginning, God takes the personality and background of each writer and implements it into Scripture, right? God wants to do the same through us today, church. I'm different than you are, and that's okay. You're, you're different than I am, and that's okay. God will use my talents and personality the way that he wants to, to teach and, and preach the gospel, right? I have my niche. My boy Wordsmith, he's got his niche, right? He's built his personality. Everything that he does is so that he can, he can get into the, to the, to the streets and the hoods that a lot of people can't get into, man. He, he's, a, he's a racial barrier breaker. We sang a line in our last song this morning. It says, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. Whatever God has given you, whatever he's given you, your job, your gifts, your whatever it is, he, he wants to multiply it. God, God doesn't duplicate, he multiplies. Duplication is I'm the same as you, you're the same as me. Multiply means we're growing and that growth can be in different ways. But here's the thing, in order to sing that line, in order to say that line, you have to know God first. You have to know God. You have to know God and that comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? Right? The, the verse of the day that I got so funny, it was Romans 10, 9. And I was thinking about, I was thinking about Romans 10, 9 today. If you, if, you can conf- if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. Now, when we get to Romans chapter 10, I'm going to really break that verse down because that verse is super, super deep. But, but, but here, here it is in a snippet. When Paul wrote that, that word believe, that means uh, unshakable, impenetrable, thought, belief, concrete. Nothing can move it. You believe in your heart 100% that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. See, the cross is useless without the resurrection. You have to understand that. The cross is useless without the resurrection. Yay, I'm forgiven of my sins. And what happens when I die? I'm gone? No. You have to have the resurrection. It's as important as the cross. In fact, it's more important because it gives us access to God in heaven. The cross, we'll get into that in a few weeks. But listen, here's the thing. When he says confess with your mouth, that that was deep. See, a lot of you won't confess with your mouth. You'll do the Jesus thing here where it's safe. It's safe here because we all like we all like Jesus. But you won't do it out in the public, man. You won't do it out in the public. And let me tell you what would happen in Rome if you confessed Jesus. You got killed. Why do you think the Christians were in the Roman Colosseum? Right? How dare you reject Caesar as God? Jesus Christ is the God of the universe. You confess that, you are going to die. That's what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. That's what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. That's what's happening to our brothers and sisters in India. That's what's happening to our brothers and sisters in North Korea. They speak the name of Jesus and it can bring death and condemnation upon them. We in the church in America are not willing to go that far. Because we're comfortable. I got my Jesus I got my Jesus swag, I got my Jesus hat, I got my Jesus shirt. I love Jesus because he gave me a nice house and he's got money and all that other kind of, that's why I love Jesus. Have it all taken away and see how much you love him. I don't care what you came in here with this morning. I don't care what hurt or pain, shame, guilt. 
I don't care what you came in here with this morning. Jesus wants to meet you, and he wants to meet you in a personal way. That it's not some fabricated, oh, Jesus, be my savior prayer. Yeah, I've, man, when I worked in probation, I had tons of jailhouse conversions. And the minute they hit the streets, they thought they didn't think one day about Jesus. I'll say the prayer and be saved. It's not saying a prayer. It's a change in your heart. It's a change in your attitude. It's a change in your spirit. That's what it is to walk with Jesus. That's what it is to walk with Jesus. So church this morning, man, if you don't know Jesus, man, you need to, you get, you need to know him now. Today is the day of salvation. If you've been on the fence with your walk with Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Fix it. Get right with Jesus. I'm not promising you that tomorrow you're going to have a flower bed, this beautiful roses. You might still have thorns, but you got Jesus when you're in those thorns. And it's all good. It's all good. There'll be men and women up here to pray with you this morning. You want to get right with Jesus. You want to get Jesus in your life. You want to have this relationship with Jesus, man. Man, come up here to the altar, man, and let these men and women pray for you because it's going to be deep. It's going to be deep. Some of you need prayer for a lot of different things. Come to the altar, man. Don't, don't let this, don't be afraid. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's, why are you up here? <laughs> You're up here because you need help. I need help. Father, we um, come to you right now and we acknowledge our dependence upon you, God, and thank you for your word and thank you for the fact that you love us so much and that, that you sent your son for us. Lord Jesus, thank you. You were the God-man that came, the only one in the whole universe who could do what you did. There's nobody in the universe that could do what you did. It was you. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. I pray today, God, for the, the heart that is hard, for the, the heart that is broken, for the heart that's desperate, for the heart that needs watering. I pray that that heart today would be revived by you. I ask, Lord, as we go through this day, that we be mindful of how much you love us. How you think about us every second of every day of every week, of every month, of every year. We are always on your mind. We thank you for that. I pray for a blessing upon all those within earshot of my voice today. That you would bless everybody from the top of the head to the sole of the feet, Lord. That they would experience your love and your grace in a most powerful way. I ask, Lord, humbly that you would help me, Father, as um. I'm struggling today, God. And I just need a touch of your, your mighty hand. So for my brothers and sisters, I pray the same thing. And God, may you just do the most unbelievable, most wonderful things through our lives because we belong to you. Thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All the saints said.